Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Myth Vision Podcast. We're going to be taking a deep dive. Does the New Testament rely, depend, or utilize Greek literature in the authorship of these Gospels, which are really anonymous? We don't know who actually wrote them. Sure, you can trust tradition, but um, do they use the Greek literature? This is a debate that happens in New Testament scholarship. Doesn't happen enough. Oftentimes, as Dr. Dennis R. McDonald says, the guild kind of suppresses it, doesn't really engage in it, doesn't really uh, bring it up. But I think he's on to something. Welcome to Myth Vision again, Dr. McDonald. How are you? Hi, Derek. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. So just to get this straight, I could run through your your uh, CV. I could run through listing off all the things. You've been a previous guest here multiple times. Um, you were a teacher at Claremont School of Theology in California. You retired there. You are the one, if I will, that has really pushed the mimesis criticism uh, position that the Gospel of Mark imitates Homeric epics, but it isn't just the Gospel of Mark. You were famously known for that back in the, what was it, 70s, 80s? 80s. 80s and you got a phd at harvard university uh what else am i missing here you, you your credentials are just bob jones university mccormick theological seminary uh, discipline and biblical studies but you're kind of a classicist at the same time a jack of all trades master of many <laughs> well you miss that i'm a banjo player so, oh you that's know. <laughs> You're just like the Homeric uh, epics, Homer, uh, the poets, uh, that, right? Yeah, uh, that's it, right, right. Yeah, you actually think that the, and it's not just you, but you think that maybe it's not a single author, but that there are poets that were involved in writing this, correct? Yeah, right, sure, yeah. So for everybody who's tuning in, he has many books that he's published. The Dionysian Gospel's a fun one from the earliest gospel. Q plus gets deep into his uh if I'm not mistaken, this is the Q plus Papias. If I'm not right. mistaken. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know you go deeper into the Q plus Papias hypothesis as well. The Homeric epics and the gospel Mark, which was one that really put them on the map. A lot of people are familiar with. If you're not, I highly recommend you read this because we're dealing with literature, not what we call history. It doesn't mean there aren't historical kernels. It doesn't mean there, there may not be, well, how do I put it? The mirage might have some physical aspects to it, but this is a mirage. It's literary. And so Luke and Virgil, imitations of classical Greek literature, the Gospels and Homer imitate. That's the one actually I didn't pack that I was showing you earlier, Dr. McDonald, is I packed up all the hundreds and hundreds of my books. But the one I didn't pack in case I have some downtime is to read this one, the Gospels and Homer. And uh, can you tell us why you told me this one I must, must read? Um, I will, but I also want to uh, tell your viewers that they shouldn't be shocked by the stickers, uh, the sticker price on those books. They are outrageously expensive. I yeah. think they're worth it, but I also know that people can't uh, go out and buy them all without, um, you know, mortgage remortgaging the house. <laughs> But um, there, I do have a, what some is now called synopses of epic tragedy and the Gospels, that is uh, coming out in two volumes, um, and it will be available at a reduced price. It will get a digest of the other books, and um, I'm hopeful. Hopefully, in about a year or a year and a half, it'll be available free as a PDF. So I'm embarrassed that these uh, price, these costs are so uh, high with uh, previous books. And in order to bring down the price, I'm actually creating Mimesis Press, um, which people can find out about by looking at my, uh, my website. And I'll Just continue to post changes on that. Um, but those, the, 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 the sticker shock um, is a problem with uh, certain kinds of scientific books. Now, the book that you're saving, I do think myself, is the most important one that I've published, even though it's only on the Gospels. It doesn't include the um, the Acts of the Apostles uh, and uh, the Gospel of John. It's primarily the synoptics. 
but it incorporates three things that I think are important. One is the uh, Q plus Papias hypothesis and a reconstruction of Q. Another is, and this is the burden of the book, uh, mimesis criticism, especially of the Homeric epics, obviously, from the title. And third, uh, social identity theory, how one can distinguish what's going on in the Gospel of Mark from the Q document, from um, Judaism generally, and how it's creating a synchrosis mm -hmm. with the Homeric epics. That is a uh, comparison. So this is not plagiarism. It's literary transformation to show that Jesus is superior to the likes of um, Achilles and Hector and, uh, and so on. So uh, my work sometimes is misunderstood to be uh, plagiar that, that Mark is plagiarizing or he's intending to hoodwink people into thinking these things actually happened. And the way I like to think of it is he's simply playing a different literary game. And we haven't seen what the other player of the game is, that is the Homeric epics, because we don't know them. And so we assume that the other player in the game is going to be the Hebrew Bible, or it's going to be historical memory, or it's going to be his um, uh, pre, you know, oral traditions. But no, he's playing a different game. He's playing a game that is uh, much more sophisticated, as Robin Walsh has talked about and discovered on her own. And so I think that's why this book is important. It um, makes it very difficult to um, say that Homer isn't involved. The other thing that I love about this book is it starts with imitations of the Iliad, goes to imitations of the Odyssey, and treats the text in the order that they appear in the books. So you actually learn not just about the Gospels, you also learn about Homer. I just want everybody to see the book up close. The Gospels and Homer, Imitations of Greek Epic in Mark and Luke Acts, the New Testament and Greek Literature, Volume 1. And uh, it's it's a hardback, the one I have, which is, like you said, expensive. But your upcoming synopsis, which we are going to plug, it's it, I'm going to be a shameless plug, as I always am, because I believe in what I'm doing here. I really appreciate the literature of the New Testament and understanding how clever, interesting, intelligent uh, the authors were. There's a reason I think that this stuck and why it is um, it has impacted the world in the way that it has. If this was just some, I don't know, not uh, intelligent in its in its uh, creation, it may not have been so successful. But you can mine it for all sorts of things, which th yeah. these authors were clever about doing. So that's what makes yeah. it kind of an ingenious thing. So when people talk about the Bible's inspired by God. Well, if you have a brilliant man or whatnot uh, writing these and they're literarily sophisticated, meaning they were trained and taught on how to write great epics or novels or something, sure, you could you could call that a form of inspiration. Someone might call it divine. I would just say it's human inspiration. Um, but yeah, either way, we're both valuing and appreciating the literature of the New Testament, even if we're coming from a humanist perspective. Now, but we need to remember that in the Homeric epics, both of them begin, as does Virgil's Aeneid, with a request from the muses to inspire them. So even the Homeric epics and the Aeneid are inspired texts. These poets think that they are actually channeling um, the muse. Hmm. So uh, this idea of inspiration is not just popping up in the Gospels. Right. It's also in a part of the uh, the poetic tradition of antiquity. That's a, something to keep in mind for sure as we continue, because I think someone actually asked that question uh, while we've been getting the introduction out of the way. I just want everybody to know I'm going to be doing also some courses with Dr. McDonald. I, I know these are hefty, big, thick intros, and we want to get into the content. Um, uh, Myth Vision's a bit different, okay? I, some of my shows I want to cut right into and skip through the intro, but I think it's necessary to lay it out for our audience, people who are serious about this stuff, to know what we have planned. I am moving to the West Coast. I'm still in the move in the 
process of moving. I've got paint to put on the trims. I've got some stuff to do to the bathrooms, all of this stuff before I leave. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little stressed out, um, overwhelmed a bit. But we're already projecting to when I get to the West Coast, Dr. McDonald is going to be coming and teaching some courses. And what we had as an idea is to go through the Gospel of Mark and the Homeric Epics and to teach maybe a seven, eight part course where he's not only showing you in the introduction, mimesis criticism, understanding why we know these authors were doing this kind of stuff, but then presenting the Gospel of Mark, kind of decoding it for you to show you the Greek epic in the gospel. And it's going to be a course, which means it's going to be behind a paywall, but you want to be taught exhaustively and showing this from the man himself. That's going to be an option. And then Luke acts, we're going to do the same thing. I can't wait to get into that because nobody's really breaking down Luke acts in the, in, in looking at the Greek literature exhaustively that way. These are goals I have in mind. Dennis, I can't wait. I can't yeah, wait till I can't I'm moved. <laughs> I can't wait till I moved. I was up till three thirty the other morning, literally painting. Um, anyway, thank you for everybody who supports us and and helps us do what we're doing. I words are words, but I really, really mean that. I really do mean that. I want to say thank you for all the support. Now, let's take some Q and A since we have some super chats already built up, and I do at some point during this, Doctor McDonald, I put on the thumbnail the Cyclops image and Jesus in another image on the side, casting out a demon. So what's going on with the garrison demoniac and the Cyclops. We can talk about that as we go along. Brute facts podcast says, what up brother driving and listening. Thank you, my friend, Eddie. I really appreciate the support. My friend, I hope you're doing all right, man. Seriously, Dennis. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Scott Duke says in your view, which criticisms of your position have the most credibility? For which of your points do you feel critics just don't get it? Um, well, that's let's see. There are two parts to that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I don't think any of the criticisms have credibility, but I can be a little more generous than that. Some of the parallels are more forced than others. Um, but many of them are really clear. My uh, metaphor for that is looking at the front range of the Rocky Mountains from Denver. Um, you know that there's a mountain range there, but some of the peaks in the distance you can't be sure of because they could be clouds, they could uh, simply um, be illusions. Um, so some people pick on the poor examples and then disqualify the mountain range. And so uh, I think um, I would accept the, um, the argument that some of the, uh, the parallels are weak, but you can't deny that this is going on um, extensively. Now, one of the criticisms that I often get is that the readers of the Gospels were not sufficiently sophisticated or educated in order to be able to appreciate um, the, uh, these texts. Um, Robin Walsh and others have shown that, in fact, not only the authors, but also the readers were sophisticated. And if people could read, they had been exposed to the Homeric epics in some way. So that um, the, the, we've dumbed down the readers, the original readers of the Gospels, in order to make ourselves look smart. Um, many, in many ways, they are smarter than we are. Now, which points do you feel critics just don't get? I think that um, the better critics are able to accept one or two of the stronger imitations. They're willing to accept that there's a mountain range there. But what they don't get is that, in fact, it requires a new methodology in order to appreciate what's going on. So the default of the discipline is redaction criticism, literary criticism that deals with the text as a whole, instead of looking for antecedent models. And so 
the uh, many critics have said, yes, okay, maybe there's this here or that there and so on, but they resort to the, uh, the dominant methodologies of the field and don't understand these as exceptions that require a new methodology. I'm arguing for a paradigm shift. I'm arguing for a disciplinary revolution, that there is so much of this going on that the old ways of doing things with historical criticism and redaction criticism just have to be augmented seriously by a shift to mimesis criticism if we're going to understand these texts. So what they don't get is the requirement of a new methodology with criteria and with careful comparison because they would rather say, well, these parallels are just coming from the culture. I've, David Litwa is an example. I'll single him out. He's very skeptical about mimesis criticism because he thinks he can handle the mythological parallels that he sees between the Gospels and uh, Greek poetry as cultural diffusion rather than a mimetic strategy. And I think that that is fudging. I think it's um, actually quite timid, and we need is to it, be much more say, explicit. Is it safe to say you're, you're? I, I thought I felt this way when I interviewed both of you on this topic. That both of you were right in that. Sure, it's cultural diffusion, of course, but it's it not is. just it cultural is. diffusion. You're saying that these people were playing with these these this literary device, like like you're suggesting they are reading this material. Whereas he's kind of saying impact from the culture around. It's both and. It's not either or. And that's what it's I both felt. And. Okay. okay. And you have to have criteria to determine which, is, which it is. I grant cultural diffusion. But one of the major ways that these myths were diffused, <laughs> were distributed, was through a mimesis. And uh, when students, when young men, almost always young men, went to school, they were introduced to a factory of mimesis. That's how they learned to write, and uh, and it was culturally significant. Just to just to follow up on that, uh, which criticisms of your position have the most credibility? I feel like what I've heard so far, and I haven't read anyone who specifically tried to take on your claims, like like engage, engage. Um, but I think that they always go after the weaker claims that are obviously less, like you admit, aren't strong. So you're like. Yeah, that's that doesn't seem like a clear one. Like the Garrison demoniac, though, you're ready to die as a soldier on that hill. I mean, like without a doubt. But other little less possible, like I get it, it's vague or it's not quite there. It's really once you start seeing the dots, you sometimes might try to fill in the gaps with the material, thinking there might be some connection. It may or may not be the case. But that's some of those right. dots exactly are clear. Right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. What is up, Vesper? Howdy. Scott Duke, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. He says, great to see you again, Dr. McDonald. How lovely, yeah. Deb with her coffee and myth fix. Emma Love said, hit the like. And she says, hi. Hello, Emma. Emmy, sorry, I almost said Emma. Thank you so much. Jennifer, woo woo, hit a beginning of a live stream. Banjo 2. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nidimus, thank you so much for the super chat. The typical response I am seeing from apologists like Jonathan McClatchy is that you have parallelomania. What's your response to that? Uh, I think um, McClatchy has parallelophobia. And I would go further and say that there's a disease called mimephobia. It's a fear of mimesis. Um, because apologists don't like to think that their sacred texts have um, analogies in the ancient world and that they're getting some of their uh, ideas from Greek mythology. And that is a phobia. Now, is there such a thing as parallelomania? Yes, there is. I don't think mimesis criticism qualifies as parallelomania. Because what we know about ancient rhetoric is that people learn to write by imitation. So inevitably, there are parallels. But the parallels are not parasitic. They are not uh, plagiaristic. 
They are culturally transformative. Now, I'd like to see some evangelicals who are interested in transforming the world by the, through the Gospels to take um, another look at what these Gospels are doing. They are trying to say that Jesus or Paul or um, other characters in the uh, Christian tradition are more noble, uh, more compassionate, and uh, more responsible than Greek heroes. So um, I would say the Gospel of Mark is an apologist himself, in a way. But you're not going to understand that if you have um, a parallelophobia, that you simply are going to reject it. I so think, this I, if I may, Dennis, just to throw this out there, and you tell me if you think I'm, I'm hitting the nail on the head. I said this before. I think the reason, first of all, they're the harmonizer Strauss so eloquently defeated hundreds of years ago. But the other thing that I notice is that I think that they see the problem. They have no problem connecting it to sacred scripture. It is written. Oh, okay. That's, that's okay. That's safe. But when you see inspiration come from non-sacred scripture, from the Greek world itself, how do they explain that? Are they supposed to say that that is sacred as well? Because if it is inspired, even if it is in attack of it's inspired or the inspiration of the gospel literary device is inspired from the Greek world. Are we going to say that that's divinely inspired literature as well? I mean, this is the problem because their whole, the fundamentalist, if you will, approach to the gospels in the new Testament requires them to say, Oh no, they wouldn't have anything to do with that. It's only Hebrew scripture, but that that's all. I don't know if you, if you would agree with me that there's this distaste in saying, we can't have them touch that stuff because that's not kosher, so to speak. Well, I have trouble with the idea of inspiration generally because it uh, sometimes gets confused already in Homer, as I said, with uh, thinking that poetry comes from the muse. But as a musician, I can tell you that um, playing a banjo, sometimes the, the banjo plays itself. I feel inspired when I play sometimes. Um, often uh, poets talk about a feeling of inspiration. I think that inspiration comes from human intelligence and human creativity and a sense that our brains are able to function in a way that we don't intend, that um, we are complex beings. And so inspiration is self-inspiration. It comes from our experience and it comes from our abilities, but our minds are able to... Uh, now, were, were the Homeric poets inspired? Well, they were inspiring and they were not inspired by a muse but by their creative capacities. And I think that's what I would say is inspiring the New Testament. Thank you so much for that, Ninimos. I appreciate it. Uh, Scott Duke, what are the chances Dr. McDonald will rewrite the Gospels and Homer as an epic poem set to the banjo and performed by the good professor? Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time <laughs> religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for Aphrodite. Um, uh, her love potions are mighty. She wears that see through nighty. She's good enough for me. You uh, actually uh, did a performance good. on this. And, and so I, I've got uh, I've got lots of examples of it. So um, that's as close as I'm going to get to writing an epic poem. Yeah. Um, but um, I shouldn't have said the banjo stuff. We're 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 getting um, <laughs> diverted from there. But I appreciate Scott's comment. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate that, man. All right, John, uh, forgive me if I mess your last name up, Mitcher, but thank you for being a member of the YouTube channel as well, my friend. Dr. McDonald, on Island of Helios, Odysseus goes up to mountain to pray, and he falls asleep while crew below stays awake. In synoptics, this is reversed. Jesus stays awake while the crew below sleeps. Possible emulation? Perfect emulation. Exactly. 
And in fact, that uh, episode likely was already imitated in the Hebrew Bible with Moses going up on Mount Sinai in order to get the law. And he comes back and he realizes that uh, Aaron has uh, created a golden calf and people are worshiping it. And for that reason, Israel, including Moses himself, cannot get into the promised land. In the example that you're giving, John, um, Odysseus goes up to pray. He comes back and his crew not only is awake, but they are sacrificing bulls, right? Hmm. And or cattle. And it's because of that they perish at sea and cannot get home. Okay. Those parallels have been seen by classicists. And um, the, the issue is whether um, in which direction is that uh, imitation going. But you have it in the, um, in the Gospels with uh, Jesus going, um, sleeping at Gethsemane and coming down and realizing that his uh, crew has fallen asleep. And just so and, we're on uh, the same page, those, those cattle or bulls, if you will, that are being sacrificed by Odysseus' men, they're actually bulls of a certain god. It was, the, it was the god's food, right? And they weren't supposed to touch it, but they did? Yeah, they, they're the cattle of Helios, right? Got it. No, that, so that's a very good example. And you uh, also have, well, um, you actually have two uh, imitations of it in the Gospel of Mark, I think. But uh, I think we can move on. Yeah. Thank you, John. Wonderful super chat. and yeah, Excellent question. Yeah. Uh, good observation. Thank you. Doc Pleromonat, thank you for being a member as well. I really appreciate it. And by the way, before I continue, Doc, I wrote you back on Patreon. I want to talk with you uh, in private if possible. Um, your questions alone pique my curiosity on wanting to do a show with you. Uh, you don't have to reveal your identity, anything like that, but I'd love to talk to you more because I think you're, I think you're somebody that I should be talking to on this show. Um, recent scholarship of John looks closer at performance criticism with Greek tragedy elements, certainly not written for the stage, but do you see bits of audience performer or demonstrative, uh, del Deltic language Dynetic. interactions? Oh, is yeah. that I? Okay, sorry. Uh, deictic, deictic language and interaction. Yes, I do. And uh, uh, Doc, you are quite right that uh, a number of scholars have seen this and they have looked at it from the pers perspective of uh, Greek tragedy. Um, one of them is a very good friend of mine, Joanne Brandt, and she's probably one of the scholars you're talking about. What your other viewers may know, a deictic language means uh, do you find kind of stage directions in the Gospel of John that are different from the stage directions that you have in the synoptics? And yes, you do. Um, statements about uh, movement um, or um, how people look and so on. I think that's a brilliant question. And yes, I do think that that's there. In Mimesis criticism, I would say it's there because some of those deictic um, uh, elements are already in the Bacchae. So I think there's a mimetic model for it. But uh, yes, I do see some of that interaction. Thank you, Doc. Really appreciate the super chat. All those support, support in the channel with that. Thank you. Hard work says, do you have a systematic rebuttal to critiques of your work that we can read? Uh, yes. If you go to my website um, and or just uh, uh, email me, uh, I can probably send you in the mail something that I call that is entitled My Turn, um, a criticism of my critics on Mimesis Criticism. It's a pamphlet, so it wouldn't cost me much to mail to you, and I have several copies, but not all that many. Um, in the synopsis that's coming out and should be out this fall, I have extensive uh, crit um, rebuttals to my critics. 
uh, including uh, David Litwa, actually. So um, actually, if you went to my website or, or you got a hold of me somehow, I probably could send you a PDF just of that, um, that part of the synopsis. I just posted his website in the, the, the comment section for everybody in the chat. Uh, be sure to go mark it, save it, whatever you'd like to do there. And uh, his email is there for you to contact so you can ask him questions or try to dive deeper. I can't promise you he always has time to respond quick, but he will at some point get to it. Um, yeah. Doc Pleroma not wow, man. Thank you. Really, really do appreciate that uh, major support. And I haven't seen you in a while, so I know you've been busy working. How do you explain the Johannine Riddles, a Boltmann classic? ecclesiastical redactor who pieced back disparate sources in the wrong order, rejects source criticism and view synchronically like Barrett or a three phase development like Brown. Oh my goodness. This person has done his work on the gospel of John. <laughs> um, the only, yes, there is a three um, phase development in the Gospel of John. Um, Brown and uh, Boltmann and others have sensed it. So people have tried to unravel or unbraid those three stages, but none of those attempts have uh, succeeded. In my synopsis, I have a synopsis just for the Gospel of John where I try to unbraid those three uh, strands and should argue that the earliest strand is the Dionysian gospel. The second is what I call the anti-Jewish gospel. And the third is the beloved disciple gospel. So um, you actually can view them um, chronologically in parallel columns and see how it develops. Um, I think, yes, there was an ecclesiastical redactor. Um, he's the person who did the third uh, uh, installment, that is the beloved disciple gospel. And Martin Hangel, I think, is a major source for that. There's only one place where I think we find um, pieces in the wrong order. The beginning of chapter five surely is in the wrong order, but I think we can explain why. And people have tried, Boltmann and others have tried to place it in different places in the Gospel of John, but I think they all fail, and I think I found out where to put it. That is, it originally appeared as a part of chapter two. Now, I don't want to go into the details because it's, it's so deep in the woods, and I'd have to justify why you have it um, where I place it, but we can see the order is wrong because of geographical and literary concerns. And we also know why the author probably had to put it in that sequence. Um, but that, uh, Doc, that's a extremely insightful question. Um, so my answer is, yes, you have an ecclesiastical redactor. He's the person responsible for the third edition, which likely is the, um, the beginning of a Johannine corpus that included the Johannine epistles and the book of Revelation. Um, yes, at some point, uh, chapter five, the, uh, the early story gets placed in the wrong order. And yes, there are three phases of uh, development. Uh, and I do think that I have uh, solved the problem of what those three stages were, how they function. And it isolates the earliest version as the one where we have most of the Dionysian material. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful response. Doc, I got to get up with you. Uh, when you get some time, we got to chat. Thank you. Constellation Pegasus in the house. Is there a chapter in the book of Revelation that retells an ancient Sumerian cosmology story? Why was John banished to an island? Well, I don't know the answer to the first question. Uh, I'm not at all uh, an expert on uh, ancient Near Eastern literature and mythology. Why was John banished to an island? Well, first of all, 
the, the Revelation of John also is a composite document. The name John appears only in the first chapter and the last chapter of the Apocalypse. There was a prophet, probably a part of the Johannian community, who was banished on an island. And he says that he's, it's because he is a, um, a witness to, uh, actually, the same word is the word for a martyr, but he's a witness to um, the gospel. And he um, is trying to warn people about um, uh, the Roman Empire and its violence. Uh, several people have argued, and I think rightly, that he was a Jewish refugee from the Jewish war who relocated in Western Asia Minor and um, carried with him uh, anti-Roman sentiments because he saw the way the Romans had devastated Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And so he was probably considered a rabble rouser. Now, whether he was placed on an island by Romans or others, we don't know. But we do know that he was really radically anti-Roman. And um, it's probably for that kind of antagonism for Rome, in my view, um, because he witnessed what Rome did to Jews in Judea, that uh, was a reason for him to warn uh, synagogues and others in uh, Asia Minor uh, not to be too cozy to Rome. Thank you so much. I just uh, posted in the chat for everybody interested in going a little bit further in Revelation, get Adela Collins book on Revelation. She does talk about a cosmic uh, dragon mythology that we're finding. I don't know exactly the source, whether Sumerian or whatnot. I mean, you can find it with Lotan. You can find it in other even, even if you're talking about um, uh, what's the name of the particular dragon in, in Job. Um, I can't think right now. Leviathan. But, yeah, Leviathan. Yeah. So there's there's definitely a chaos dragon mythology that is taking place. And yeah. this author knows right. about it. And it's kind of a cyclical book that repeats itself. But um, I would check her book out because it's kind of a commentary. And I really enjoyed it when I read it. So I yeah. went ahead and put that she, down there in the chat. She was one of my teachers. And you, so was Dom yeah. Crossan. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much going on here. Thank you so much, uh, Constellation Pegasus, for the question. Scholar Vids, good to see you here. Which mimesis do you think is dominant in the Gospels? Of Jewish heroes like Moses and Elijah or of Greek heroes like Odysseus and Hector? <laughs> what a great question. Um, when we talk about the Gospel of Mark, uh, clearly, the, uh, the, the parallels are more Odysseus and Hector. But do we find mimesis of uh, Moses and Elijah in the Gospels? Most definitely we do. But much of that comes from the Q document. The Q document is interested in showing that Jesus is the promised prophet like Moses, though he is more compassionate than Moses. He's a prophet who can perform miracles like Elijah, and uh, he will return in the future to um, restore Israel, just as people talked about Elijah returning um, uh, someday. So what I, um, and you would see this in the new synopsis that's coming out. It um, uses the Q document as I reconstruct it, reconstruct it as one of the columns for the synopsis. It's actually the first one. And it, so your question is terrific. Jewish heroes like Moses and Elijah are the ones that are imitated in the Q document. And they inform the synoptics. So we find uh, the same thing in uh, Matthew and Luke, somewhat less so in Mark. But when we get to the Gospel of Mark and later Luke Acts, the heroes are from the Greek world. And this is why social identity theory is so important. 
um, the, the Q document is coming from a Jewish context. I think it was actually written by a Jew who thought Jesus was cool because he had a different understanding of the kingdom of God and um, the function of Jewish law. But when you get to the Gospel of Mark, which is written after the Jewish war, you have a different social context, not just historically because of the war, but also because now the primary literary models are going to be from the Greek world. Um, so that's a terrific question. And uh, I bet you would like to read the synopsis and it would give you a better, uh, fuller um, uh, answer to your question, which is really a very, very good one. And, and, and I might just tag this on. I thought it was interesting. We've already talked about Moses going up. There's a mimetic connection between uh, Odysseus going up, his men falling asleep. Well, no, not his men falling asleep, the reverse. But the idea is they sacrifice these Helios uh, cattle um, and Moses, same thing. But on the Mount of Transfiguration that we find in Mark, um, I wanted to ask you, Josephus seems to have in his writings, whatever in Second Temple Judaism started to make Moses not dead, but that he had an ascension and apotheosis. So Josephus doesn't have Moses die. And this is a huge red flag that goes off in my head because in the Hebrew Bible, it has a God buried Moses. Jews didn't like that, of course, because God can't bury the dead. They wouldn't want him unclean, uh, and it seems to imply that. But Josephus has Moses ascend like Elijah ascends, never dies, which made me think that this whole Moses and Elijah appearing on the mountain in Mark is in line with that same idea, Hellenistic idea, that Moses had an apotheosis, or Hellenistic Jewish idea, had an apo apotheosis, which is why he appears— with Elijah, they may be the two witnesses in Revelation, for all I know. I don't know. But the point is, is there a mimetic connection to the Greek literature in the Mount of Transfiguration? Yes, there is. And, but it also clearly is evoking the tradition that you're talking about, that Josephus knows that Moses and Elijah um, that were raised or, or ascended, actually. Um, so, but... Uh, I'm going to tell you and uh, uh, tell you a story that comes from the Odyssey. Odysseus, like Superman, is a man of power, but he's disguised as a beggar so that people won't recognize him because if the suitors do, they'll kill him. Athena transfigures him into his real appearance so he can disclose his identity to his son Telemachus. Telemachus, so she turns him into the beautiful uh, male that he was, and Telemachus says, oh my gosh, you must be a god. Let me make, offer sacrifices to you so that um, you don't punish me. And Odysseus says, no, 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 I'm your father. Uh, but you can't tell anybody I'm here because if you do, the suitors will kill me. So Jesus is on a mountain with some of his most intimate disciples. God transfigures him so that he appears in his glory. Peter says, whoa, Let's build three uh, tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And a voice from heaven says, no, 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 no. This is my beloved son. Obey him. <laughs> so that now you have the father revealing to the son, uh, to, to the others. And then they come down from the mountain and Jesus says, you can't tell anybody about this. Don't tell them what you saw. Why? Because the um, his uh, Jewish opponents will kill him if they realize that he's got. And so later on, Jesus does reveal his identity to the Jewish authorities at his trial, and it ends in his death. So this is, a, you put your finger on a magnificent example of what I call eclectic mimesis. You have the Jewish stuff advertised because Moses and Elijah are there. 
And uh, you have the uh, disguised imitation of the Odyssey by having the transfiguration of Jesus imitating the transfiguration of, of, of Odysseus. It's a magnificent oh, example. Man. It's so eclectic. And I, I yeah, just, that's it. how many people watching right now, like seriously, give a shout out in the chat. If that's the kind of stuff that you love that we bring to, at Myth Vision. I love that stuff. That's the stuff that makes me go, wow. You mean to tell me you used to try to threaten me with hellfire and danger in the church with this kind of stuff? No. don't. But also don't tell me I can't appreciate this as yeah, literature. Right. So like this is what I live for. And this kind of stuff is amazing <laughs> material that you bring out that you're not finding anywhere else. So let me know in the chat if you like this kind of stuff as well as I do. Thank you, Dennis, for answering my question. I, it wasn't – it was – tacked on to scholar vid super chat scholar vid thank you constellation pegasus again with forgery forgeries in the gospel of mark a lot of this man-made and not god-inspired bible made sense where all of this influencing came from inspired mostly at the time of being written i suppose that's accurate um i don't like the word forgery um, I think that the author is actually making quite clear what he's trying to do. And he's trying to say that, um, so this man-made book, yes, Mark is a person and he made it. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know whether, because I'm an atheist, I don't think it's God-inspired um, but we can say where the influences are coming from. They're coming from the Jewish Bible, but they're also coming from classical Greek poetry. The inspiration comes in the process of writing, just as um, in a concert, one can improvise and find inspiration in creating music. So that, no, I don't think you're... Uh, understanding of it is quite accurate. And I don't know what your agenda is behind it. But I think what we can say is not the forgeries of the Gospel of Mark, but the imitations of Mark made by this human and not by God in, in, um, inspiring um, was influenced by classical Greek poetry. So um, I trust that that's an acceptable um, paraphrase uh, and a modest correction of your question. I think that Constellation comes from the same kind of, it's a different, he was from the Jehovah's Witnesses um, and that apocalyptic cultic uh, background. But I think he's coming from a similar background in terms of how we held the literature of the Bible and how we viewed it. And uh what I'm trying to do with myth vision isn't just ha 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 stupid book, stupid teaching, stupid stuff. There are some outdated things. Sure. You're going to see some crap that you're going to go. Yeah, that's ridiculous uh, for today's time, but I want to value and appreciate literature. There is no, like if we were talking about literally, there's no way Moses, Elijah, Jesus are on a mountain and this happened. Right. So we can go, ha ha. But in our imagination, you could play and have fun, just like I watch Iron Man on TV, and I wish there was a real Iron Man. I, I, I enjoy well, the, the fiction, you know? You're exactly right. You know, uh, people need to remember that my career was at uh, progressive Christian seminaries. I'm not trying to talk my students out of not going into ministry. I'm trying to make them less stupid about what they're going to say in the pulpit <laughs> and in Sunday school. And um, there's a thrill that comes with an understanding of these texts as beautiful human artistic projects. Right. And I don't think that is getting through to the churches. The, what people are interested in is historical bedrock instead of creative, um, uh, a more aesthetic understanding and appreciation of what these texts are. And there's another payoff too. 
when you understand these gospels as transformations of Greek mythology, they're not plagiarizing, they're culturally transforming these texts so that Jesus is not a violent hero like um, Hector, um, I mean, like Achilles. Um, he rises from the dead, unlike Hector, so that there is a theological and, uh, and especially an ethical bump that the Christian church can have in its own culture. Because you, what do you think, Derek? Do you think we live in a culture that's violent? Mm. Do you think we live in a culture that um, is, uh, is not respectful and is uh, not compassionate? Uh, I'm confronted with that all the time. I think the church needs to step up and understand that its most valued texts, the Gospels, are in fact trying to transform culture to make it more comp com compassionate, less violent, and, uh, and, and more open. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate your uh, Super Chat Constellation. Thank you. Free Thought. We see conquered people imitate the conquering culture, but do we see this in reverse? Is the act of imitating an act of loyalty or assimilation? Is the act of imitating an act of loyalty or assimilation? Um, let's talk about it in terms of Luke Acts. Luke acts as a very sophisticated attitude toward the Roman Empire. He wants the new religious movement to be compatible with the Roman Empire. And so you have um, Cornelius the Centurion, um, who is uh, the first person, uh, the first Gentile to be transformed and so on. And the um, Acts of the Apostles ends with uh, Paul preaching the kingdom of God without hindrance in Rome, even though he's going to be uh, executed. And the author knows he was executed. So uh, it's assimilation in a way, but it's also rivalry. That is the values of peace and um, world domination and so on for the author of Luke Acts is better accomplished in the Christian movement than it is in the Roman Empire. So that the values of the empire are more at home in the kingdom of God and the growth of this Christian movement than um, in the empire itself. And um, St. Augustine actually understood this in parts of the city of God he um, says, okay, Rome is falling. That's a tragedy, but the kingdom of God will survive. And some of the values of the Roman Empire are going to persist now with the, um, the, the Christian movement uh, having a new political background. So I don't think it's um, loyalty. It, in a way, it is assimilation. But at, at in the second century, it's also a matter of friendly rivalry. Seriously, thank you for that. Appreciate your uh, question, Free Thought. Jennifer Sills, how exciting is it as a scholar that so many of us outside of academia are so interested in your work? It's thrilling. Um, I can tell you that Inside academia, there's much more skepticism um, and uh, rivalry than there is with people who are not scholars and outside academia. And it's thrilling to me. Um, my students loved my classes, as far as I can tell, but they weren't sure what they could do with it in the academy or in the church. And to find people who recognize the creativity of these texts and a bother to uh, explore myth vision and all of the wonderful people that you have um, have on, um, it really is thrilling to us. And I wish there was a way of having a kind of, um, what could I say, podcast church where people could get together and uh, I could play the banjo as the hymn for the hymns and uh, whatever, but um, 
Jennifer, thanks so much for your encouragement. And Derek, you are a prince in getting this done. Now, I want to say one more thing. I do love um, Myth Vision, but I don't agree with everything that happens for, with the people you uh, you interview. Right. So at some point, it would be great to have a, a large chat, even among scholars, and kind of duke it out. That's actually what why I do what I do. For example, and I don't want to get caught up in this. We could deal with this another day. You mentioned the Johannine Corpus. You included the Book of Revelation. My recent interview with John Dominic Crossan was, why is the book of John so anti-Jewish and the book of Revelation so anti-Roman? It's almost like pro-Jewish, and then the other one is anti-Jewish, and, and why? And, of course, he goes, that's because they're not part of the same corpus. Now, you say they are. Okay, guess what? We have a disagreement. Here's where I need you and John Dominic Crossan to have a conversation. This is what I want to do. Or even if the conversations don't happen, which I hope they do, it's letting the audience see the tension among academics is what the problems are. And at the end of the day, if you're done watching countless hours of my material, and trust me, you can get lost and probably never watch it. You could spend a lifetime trying to watch everything I've done already. I plan on doing this on end. My point is you're going to walk away and go, yet people are dangling your soul over a flame. And even the most brilliant minds can't figure all of this out but your soul is all dependent on it. Get out of here. So at the end of the day, I hope that at the very least people walk away and go, there's no way. Like if people that smart and have spent that much time digging into this, you know, can't really get to the bottom of it. Cause maybe our evidence isn't the best. Then what the heck are we doing over here? Listening to the fundamentalist knocking on our front door, telling us you're going to hell. If you don't believe in this message that they really don't understand. You see, so so anyway, it's I've got a lot of missions and goals I want to do with the channel, and you're right about that, Dennis. Thank you. Vesper, thank you so much for the super chat. What are the Leviticon Gospels of the Johannites? I don't know. I have no idea. Vesper, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Vesper, please follow through. Um, I'm not certain what your question is there. Um Thank you so much, though, for the super chat. Doc Plural Monat, John of Patmos and Ignatius preached in common grounds, but do you see a difference in authority? How would each answer? Who should succeed Jesus, prophets or apostles? I guess Justin and Gaius picked it up later. Um... I, the whole development of authority in um, the early church is difficult. And what you've got with John of Patmos is someone who thinks that the uh, prophets are more important. And I think that indicates that it comes from a, an earlier stage. This goes back to your statement about Cross and, and the book of Revelation. I think the core visions of the book of Revelation um, come out of the mid 80s or 90s before the end of the, uh, the Gospel of John. Ignatius would be writing about 20 or 30 years later. Ignatius, um, as you can tell from his name, is not coming from Palestine, where John, I think, was. He was an exile. And he had a miserable experience with um, um, the the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the war in uh, the Jewish war, and he considered himself a prophet. And so you have a kind of a charismatic leader responsible for uh, the various churches, apparently. Ignatius, though, although coming from the east. Um, is a part of a developing authority of the church that is transmitted not by prophecy, but by institutions, especially the bishopric, but also presbyters. Presbyters used to be simply people who are old enough to have experienced the early Jesus movement, but then it becomes something that can be transmitted with the laying on of hands or uh, other structures. Um, I must say that I'm not 
um, an authority on all of the delicacies that go with uh, the discussion about the growth of um, the, the authority. But you're right, uh, Doc, that John of Patmos has a model for prophets. And later on, you have uh, authority that appeals to the apostles, but then the, uh, bi the uh, bishopric and the, uh, the presbyters um, um, are taking over. And uh, then, of course, this leads to uh, Rome, the Roman episcopacy and the pap papacy uh, in the end. Mm. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate the super chat. Um, Italius, Italis, sorry if I butchered your name. Any connection between Jesus walking on water and Alexander famously walking across the sea during the siege of Tyre? Is it Tyre? Um, well, no, I don't think there's a direct connection, but there's an immediate uh, intermediate connection. That is, um, you have uh, Poseidon who can walk on water, Athena can walk on water, Hermes can walk on water. It's something that can be done in the Greco-Roman world by any number of characters. Jesus is walking on water in the Gospel of Mark, probably is an imitation of Hermes walking on water to um, Priam um, when he goes to uh, get the body of, um, of Hector in Iliad 24. But people would have known that story. It was one of the most famous stories of, uh, of all antiquity. Um, Priam, who's lost his son, ransoming his son, yeah, and his, then after that, the uh, the Trojan War and so on. So I think the, that you have Alexander walking um, over water. Um, you have also Vespasian, I think, doing so. Um, it should not come as a surprise. So I don't think there's a direct relationship, but I mm -hmm. think in this case, Litwa would be right. It's a it's cultural diffusion of a common myth that people can demonstrate their remarkable powers by walking on water. Didn't Athena kind of hover in a way or a fly across the water or something like that, that might play a significant role. I know Yahweh of course is hovering over the face of the waters in the Hebrew Bible. Maybe there's some, something there. Well, the way it works in, uh, in Homeric antiquity, is um, you have Iris, you have Athena, and you have Hermes all playing the role of uh, Angeli, that is angels. And in order to get from um, uh, Mount Olympus or uh, Mount Ida uh, to Troy, you have to go over a body of water. So what they have is magical um, um, feet. They put on sandals that in art are demonstrated with uh, wings. You have FTD florists with a view of Mercury, that is Hermes, with sandals with wings. So fly through the air, but they also can skim over the ocean. And uh, we have art that shows these deities um, with their winged sandals uh, going over the water. So, um, uh, yes, they, they're they water walkers. I was going to grab an image and show that even real quickly just to let people kind of see um, an example. You see the flying on the feet here with the sandals. It's in the Very heart. good example. And he's carrying the caduceus, um, <laughs> caduceus which is his wand that puts people to sleep, but also um, wakes them up. There's another example. Mm. Thank you so much, Dennis. Really appreciate that. Constellation Pegasus. Wow. Big super chat. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the support. For real. I, um, I just want to say thank you so much. I get very infuriated at stuff like this. The last chapter of Mark was added to later. To me, that's a forgery. I'm better off sticking to physics since I've proven to myself Judaism and Christianity is man-made and no God exists. I'm torturing myself to keep this up. And then uh, just to follow up with that, 
He said, I get pissed off realizing I was lied to most of my life from Jehovah's Witnesses. It's effing embarrassing. Um, I share your pain. But I don't know that I would be infuriated. Um, the last chapter of Mark was added later. Um, but I think it's a part of the ongoing literary creativity of um, early Christians who are trying to make the Jesus story work for them. And um, so I'm a little more generous about it. Um, but I also am furious that um, especially white Protestants, but other uh, religious uh, Christian groups too, have uh, been so ignorant about modern science and have not taken um, science sufficiently um, seriously. And I think we find evidence of that all the time. I mean, even the, you know, I'm going to show my politics, even the recent Supreme Court decision was not basing its judgments on science and what science um, has to offer in our understanding of um, the, the problems related to abortion. They don't understand the science of uh, psychology or sociology, of the harm that this does. And I think the, um, some Christian groups have been so accustomed to suspending uh, understanding of science because they have texts in which miracles are happening all the time that we become inured to science. And um, I think the gospel, uh, I'm going to put this out. I don't think I've ever said this publicly the same way. I think the gospel authors would be pissed off at the way we read those texts now. They had more of a, an appreciation of a science, the science they knew, than we give them credit for. And um, they're not trying to hoodwink people. They're trying to say uh, our mythology is more compassionate than another mythology. But please, please, please don't read our texts as history, histories. Um, this is another place where David uh, Litwa and I disagree. He thinks they were trying to communicate history, but it was a mythologized history. I don't think they were trying to do so at all. I think they were trying to write an alternative mythology that was more compassionate. And the way too many people read the Gospels has little to do with compassion or science. And unfortunately, Jehovah's Witnesses are among those who, um, in my view, I have um, lamentable distortions of what the Gospel authors are trying to accomplish. Mm. Appreciate your compassionate response, Dennis. And once again, Constellation, thank you uh, for the financial support. I really appreciate that, especially now in, in uh, tough times. So thank you. Topic discuss. Thank you for being a member, Gary. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It's my buddy, Gary. And he was a Mormon. I'm not sure where he wants to categorize himself. I don't want to say past tense. But he's definitely aware of this stuff that we're discussing now. So I don't care where he falls. He's my friend. I would like to see Myth Vision offer degree program to us loyal followers. Bachelor degree in Myth Vision, master's, doctorate. I will Look, I would love to set that kind of thing up. But I must admit, it would obviously be kind of like what we talk about fictive kinship. It would be fictive degrees um, through a Myth Vision program like that. As long as everybody understands I'm not being serious about something like that. I would consider that. That doesn't mean I wouldn't value you as an educated viewer or someone who is aware. I mean, if it's just uh, I wouldn't want someone running around there literally bolstering, acting like, oh, I have a real bachelor's degree or I have a real master's or a Ph.D. Where'd you get that from? A guy who doesn't have a Ph.D. named Derek on Myth Vision. <laughs> but but you get where I'm going with this. So uh, I'd like to respond to that myself, too. Derek. Um, one is I uh, I share the desire to have something like that. And then I'm going to say that I don't think it's impossible. I think it's impossible for Derek and Myth Vision to do it. 
I do think it would be very interesting to approach other institutions who already have um, programs and to put together um, a, a curriculum that's based on not just myth vision, but other kinds of podcast uh, things uh, and have a, a testing program so that there may be institutions that would be willing to um, uh, adopt um, an online um, project as long as it had credibility, as long as they could vet um, the, the, the faculty and uh, have some evaluation uh, project, um, such as a, a thesis or um, whatever. I think it would be perfect for some seminaries uh, who have uh, online programs for masters of, uh, for doctors of ministry, demint programs. So I think the issue ought not to be, uh, Derek, put on your shoulders. But I think uh, it would be possible to be creative in approaching some seminaries or uh, universities about what it would be like to create a uh, legitimate, intellectual, uh, intellectually reliable uh, program that could be marketed um, using primarily um, the podcast information. Well, we are doing courses and I have not launched that site yet, meaning once that goes public, you'll all know about it because we've got courses already recorded with Litwa, Dr. M. David Litwa, um, Delcy Allison Jr. I'm editing all these in the process right now. Um, I'm also going to be doing Dr. James Tabor and Dennis McDonald. So um, I know that in some of their curriculums, these courses that we're going to have, there will be kind of like question and answers and things like that test, if you will, for those who are interested in taking it, you don't have to, but Dr. James D. Tabor is going to be doing something on Mark. And so it'll be interesting to see you take those courses and maybe there's something I can figure out where uh, people can get those kind of things. It's something I need to wrap my head around with everything else I already have going on, but yeah, you will get to take actual courses and uh, I am calling that MVP courses. So, and for those who don't know MVP, it's Myth Vision Podcast. So anyway, thank you so much, Gary. M. Doug, did the eating of bread as symbolism of ritual cannibalism occur many times in Greek myth? No. Um, no. Um, not that I know of, no. You would suggest um, what that happens? Dionys Oh, sorry. Well, no, go ahead. No, no. Dionysus, uh, the Titans chewing you go deep into your book on this the titans in it in his uh infancy eat him uh and they chew and rip his flesh they tear his flesh with their teeth this idea uh and then of course he's water into wine guy but well you have um ritual cannibalism um especially in the dionysian uh cult apparently but it doesn't involve eating bread. So I'm focusing on the beginning of the question of the eating of bread as a mm -hmm. symbolism. Um, and this is where you get the notion of a transubstantiation um, in the Eucharist where uh, the bread actually becomes the, the body and therefore you have a kind of ritual cannibalism. By the way, the Gospel of Mark already knows of the cannibalistic implications of the Eucharist mm -hmm. because um, the... Um, the passage in which Jesus um, sends out the disciples to find a place for the Passover and they follow a water carrying man to an upper room and so on, uh, where the, uh, the so-called Lord's Supper takes place is based, in my view, on a passage in the Odyssey where Odysseus sends um, some, um, a search party to follow a woman who's carrying water and she goes to the citadel of her parents and find the, uh, the, the search party realizes that uh, they're cannibals. This is the Lystragonian uh, episode. And it really is a fascinating connection between the Gospel of Mark uh, placing its cannibal ritual in the context of a narrative where you have cannibalism already in the Odyssey. Mm. Thank you for that question, Doug. M. Doug. Oh, holy smokes. <laughs> Topic discuss. Gary, thank you so much. 
for that uh, massive super chat. Uh, I'm going to call you when I get off of here, man. Thank you for the uh, support. Seriously, appreciate that. I hope you pick up if you're not too busy at work or something. I am trying to outrun Constellation Pegasus on Super Chats. <laughs> are, are you uh, rewriting uh, Super Chats here to be better or something? <laughs> Thank you for the Super Chat, Gary. Everybody go subscribe, please. Show people support like this if you believe in what we're doing here at Myth Vision and subscribe to their YouTube channels. I'm actually a member of his YouTube channel. He's a member of mine, and um, we are good friends. So please show some love to the family. Thank you. Uh just want to say thank you. Nidimus, rather than going to up the mountain of the gods, Jesus comes down from the mountain to cross the water to his disciples. Rather than going up to the mountain to the gods. Well, I guess that's an interesting observation. Um, but I think Jesus coming down from the mountain to cross the water to the disciples is more what, what like what one finds at the end of the Iliad. That is, Hermes comes down from Mount Olympus, crosses the water because of his magical um, uh, sandals, and comes to uh, Priam, um, who's carrying a fortune from Troy to ransom his, um, his son. When... Um, when Priam recognizes that there's an enemy soldier right in front of him, he doesn't recognize it, him as um, Hermes. He thinks he's an enemy. And um, finally, um, Hermes reveals his real identity. He jumps into the chariot that Priam is, uh, has and he goes off to rescue the body of his son. So what happens in the Gospel of Mark? Jesus is watching the disciples uh, trying to cross the water, and they're in trouble. He walks on the water to his disciples. They think he's a phantom, and they're afraid. He says uh, not to fear, um, and then he says, it is I. Uh, and that's almost a direct quotation, quotation from what Hermes says, ego me. And then he climbs up into the boat, just as um, Hermes climbed into the chariot. Now, give me a break. Now, it is true that um, you could the theologize and say Jesus comes down to be with humans, whereas um, the humans had to go to the mountain of the gods, uh, of, of like Moses even. Um, but I really think, really think that the uh, more compelling parallel appears at the end of the uh, of the Iliad. Mm. I really appreciate that. I'm going to have to share a few things because we've got some amazing stuff going on here. Real quick, uh, topic discusses YouTube channel. I literally posted the link in the chat. Please go subscribe to Gary for that for the support, obviously. But he's he's a friend of mine, and I am a member of his YouTube channel as well. He talks about everything, a lot of things I don't talk about on my channel. He gets into politics and other things as well. So please check him out. He's big science-minded as well. So I know Constellation Pegasus mentioned earlier about science, big science. And then also um, for ScholarVid, for the great Super Chat earlier, I wanted to show you. You can't hear it, but this was us the other night um, in the house. We've been working, painting. This I can't even tell you the last time this room was painted in our house. Um, but he's like, you don't have any paint on you. Well, it's water. Uh, I, we use water base instead of oil. So we're, uh, having fun here in the house, I'm trying to get a clip where you could see me in case you're doubting my existence as, as a painter. Let's see, this one's 48 seconds here. Uh, where am I tried to reverse it. I was wearing a mask for those who are friends of mine on Facebook. Anyway, you get the point. I, that was to Mama. So uh, show Mama is kind of proud of the work I was doing. Thank you, Ninimus, for that super chat. And uh, I'm laughing at the kind of battles going on between super chats and the support here. <laughs> Crossover Maniac, what is the evidence for the gospel being intended as allegory myth? I've heard Mark 4, 10 through 13, and he spoke to them in parables. Are there other verses that hint of the gospels as allegory? 
Well, most of the parables that we have in the Gospels are, in fact, allegories. And you have this already in the Q parables. Um, I want to uh, give you an example of it. Um, tell me what this sounds like. Okay. There was a man who was going to go on a big journey. And he puts his servants in charge. One uh, for uh, feeding um, the slaves. And he goes off for a long time. And the servants think he's never coming back. So one of them decides that he's going to eat and drink um, with drunkards. And he doesn't feed the people that he's supposed to feed. So when the master finally comes home, what is he going to do? He takes that um, uh, uh, unfaithful slave and he hacks him into pieces. This is the Gospels. This is the Q document. This is attributed to Jesus. Now, when Odysseus leaves Ithaca, he puts his slaves in charge. Um, and Melanthius is in charge of the goats. But he thinks that Odysseus has died at sea, and he's got all of these young men who are feasting at uh, Penelope's expense, and he joins them in their drunkenness. Now, what does Odysseus do when he comes back unexpectedly? He punishes Melanthius by hacking him to death, by dismembering him. So here we have a Q parable. Now, what is the allegory? It's a double allegory. It's, an, it's mimetic of uh, Odysseus coming back and hacking to death Melanthius. But it also is an allegory of Jesus after is he's, he's died and he's absent for a long time. And he's placed the 12, the disciples, and others as responsible for feeding the uh, other servants. But um, if some of those servants are not faithful, what's going to happen when Jesus returns? He's going to punish them cruelly because they haven't done what they were told. So th this is um, happening in many of the parables that have not been seen mimetically. They've been seen over against Jewish backgrounds. They've been seen internally um, uh, and compared with each other. Each other, But many of them, uh, like the one I just mentioned, have... Uh, narrative backgrounds. So they are um, what I would call mimetically allegorical. That is, there is a census plenty or a fuller sense to the parable that is um, uh, that compares, in this case, Jesus with Odysseus. Thank you so much for that, Dennis. I always, when we get our courses and we go through Mark, I'd love to go through this exhaustively. If we have to do more than eight lectures, we can. We'll have the time and the course will be phenomenal. So thank you, Crossover Maniac. And it's good to see you in the chat. It's been a while since I've seen some of the names here. Um, I've also not been as busy on Myth Vision, which has kind of hurt me um, with the algorithm's sake and whatnot. Uh, I've been working on my house and my family. Once I get out west and situated, I'll be able to put a lot more eggs into this, meaning more time, into actually doing these lives and hanging out with you and doing all this stuff. So I want to say thank you to everybody in the chat for the super chats because it's been a while since I've been doing lives like that. And it's just because I'm busy with life, like real life going on and still trying to balance this. Constellation Pegasus, holy smokes. My friend, please email me. Is there something I can do um, for what you're doing for me? Uh, I really appreciate the over generous uh, gifts that you're giving through Super Chats, even though you're asking questions or making statements. Please message me and let me know if there's something I can do. If I'm visiting a scholar, I can get a special recording in, something like that for you, because I would love to pay back in some way. That way you don't feel like you're just donating um, I know I'm working, but please email me. Let me know if I can do something for you. He says, another last thing. Speaking of future pastors going to seminary, 
Why in the hell don't let us know some of the funny business going on in the Bible? Bad for business? Hmm. I smell intellectual dishonesty. I just beat topic discuss in super chats. And another last thing, physic is everything. Um, I don't think it's intellectual dishonesty. I think it's intellectual um, fear. Um, these uh, people come to seminary because they want to get a union card. And the union card is going to give them be given them by denominations. And denominations are going to have committees that have um, lay people and academics uh, or, or other clergy. And those clergy got their union cards by saying that the Bible is the word of God and it's a revelation and uh, Jesus will save your soul and so on. So anything that challenges that, that these students uh, get in the classroom, um, they can be excited about it themselves. But then they have to ask the question, is this going to feed my um, ministry? Am I going to be able to get the union card? So it's intellectual fear and cowardice, in my view, that they um, hide this information and I suppose one could say it's dishonest, but I can understand why they do it. But my experience has been over and over again, when people actually do use mimesis in, let's say, adult education or with young people or occasionally in a sermon, it lights sparks. People like it in the pew, but they don't know how what to do with it. And because um, for many denominations, it's required to say that the Bible is the word of God or whatever, sure. um, the students really are understandably timid. And because these institutions have, in many cases, very rigid theological requirements and, um, uh, and are not going to let people in the ministry so uh, who hold these uh, deviating and radical views. So I guess I understand it, but it's terribly disappointing. And um, I know of uh, several people who are trying to change how denominations work to make them more fr free in understanding um, what the Bible is as a human book that has it contains wisdom and um, corporate knowledge and needs to be venerated but not worshipped and um but it it really is disgusting that we're caught in that place and that we valorize ignorance as much as we do and i think another little just tack on to that that i think is important speaking of future pastors going to min to seminary a lot of these seminaries are actually telling these pastors some of these more advanced things. They may not be all the way at mimesis where we're talking about Greek literature and whatnot, but they're finding out their problems, contradictions. They know this stuff when they go through seminary, a lot of these documentary hypotheses, or at least some form of supplementary or documentary about the Hebrew Bible. They know there's problems, but what they do is I think what he's pointing at is bad for business is they know when they package it for their church, they're just going to compromise for the audience that gets them the, the bigger audience and helps them get more attention, more money, all of that kind of stuff, rather than just speaking the facts and the truth. The next time you imagine going to a Baptist church and your pastor goes, guess what? There's holes in the Bible. Guess what? There's problems. The Bible is not inerrant, infallible, and whatnot. That's not going to get you more members and get you more, not in America, I'm saying. You're not going to grow your church here no. in, in North Carolina by doing that. You're going to get it by saying, and God said, you know, you just grab them by the emotions and make them feel like, hey, this dream is really perfect when I just went through seminary and I know it's not. So there is dishonesty in that respect. It's it's that they're not they're not doing it. For fair enough. Yeah, that's, that's what fair I was. Enough, yeah. Vesper followed up, said um, for the earlier thing, the Levit Leviticon gospel was adopted by revivalist French Templars of the 19th century and alleged by them to have been discovered in the temple at Paris along with other objects. It was supposed to have been composed in the 15th century by Greek monk uh, Nisiphorus. Nisiphorus, Nisiphorus, yeah. Okay, who sought to combine Muslim tenets with Christianity, Muslim. 
Yes, I guess I have heard of that. Uh, I have nothing to contribute to it, but Vesper, thank you for enlightening me. Thank you so much, Vesper, for following up. I had no clue what you were talking about. Constellation Pegasus said, I'm not rich. I value truth. Either way, Good let me you. know what I can do, my friend. That's true for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, he spent a lot of money, so please message me if I could do something to uh, help your conscience feel like that was worth spending, especially since I do these trips. I go in person. I'm not just a guy who sits in his garage, which is where I'm at when I do all my recordings right now and interviews people remotely. I do the hard work. I drive, I carry equipment, I hook up audio devices. I edit this content. I, I try to produce really high quality stuff. So let me know if I can do something, email me. And I think we are caught up. I just want to make sure. Oh, almost constellation Pegasus. Again, churches have union cards. <laughs> no, they have ordination procedures. So that was metaphorical. Um, so the, the union card would be it, like getting ordained and then, um, the, some denominations will help you find a church. Thank you. Constellation again. All right. The thumbnail, how is this? I'll, I'll give the story for those who may not know, or just to give us a little something to go off of in our heads. There's this man cutting himself and he's in a cave in the New Testament, and he's possessed by a demon, or possessed by plural demons. Um, and it is so powerful that he's breaking the chains, and everyone's afraid of him. They stay away from him. But Jesus comes, and of course is engaging head-on with this, what we call the Gerasim demoniac. What is the Greek literary connection here and how do you explain that story um well i'm going to actually um say a little bit more about the markin story first um jesus and 12 disciples are on a boat and they go to a shore and they meet a solitary person there who lives in the caves the uh, the demons who are possessing this person recognize who Jesus is, and they say, don't harm us. And Jesus says, um, what is your name? And uh, um, the, the demoniac answers, um, my name is Legion because we are many. Jesus exercises the... Um, the demons and sends them into swine and then drowns them in the sea. Let's start with the Circe story. Circe transforms soldiers into swine in order to eat them later. Odysseus comes up and uh, he's not affected by the drug because Hermes has given him a, a, an antidote. And uh, he draws his sword, and she says, uh, do not harm us, which is what um, the garrison demoniac asked Jesus, do, do, not, do not harm me. Um, the demons ask to be turned into the swine, and so Jesus plays the role of Circe in turning people into swine and then drowning them in the sea. Later in the Odyssey, all of Odysseus's men drown in the sea. So already we have in this crazy story about Jesus, you know, having some 2,000 um, soldiers who become swine going into the sea is an imitation of Circe. Now, the reason they're called legion is uh, Mark's uh, antipathy for Roman power writing after the Roman war. So it was the 10th legion, and by the way, legion is a transliterated word from Latin, legio, um, so um, the, the, the legion or legio. Um, but what about the garrison demoniac himself? Odysseus in his sh 12 ships put into the uh, archipelago of the, Cyclo the Cyclopes. 
And in the mountains, there are herds of goats that are grazing. They come, go into a cave and they find a solitary caveman who um, uh, no one can subdue. Um, so uh, th that is very similar to the Gerasene demoniac. Now, what happens after the swine are drowned in the sea? The residents who are concerned about their um, the loss of their um, a swine come and um, ask Jesus to leave their area. And he does so after he's exercised the demon. And when he's on board ship, he calls back and says, no, you can't come with me, um, demoniac. Um, go back and tell people what the Lord has done for you. What happens after Odysseus steals the sheep from Odysseus and blinds him? The other cyclops, the cyclops these, mean, right? The, the cyclo yeah, the cyclops. Um, the other cyclopes come to um, the site and they say, who is bothering you? Well, just as the demoniac gave a, a, a wrong answer about his name, Legion, Odysseus had given a wrong answer about his name. He called himself Utus, nobody. So when the Cyclopes say, hey, who's bothering you? He says, nobody is harming me. They say, well, there's not such a problem. Uh, get over it. So um, then the Cyclops has to worry about himself. He throws a big stone um, against Odysseus's ship as he's de departing. So Odysseus is already on the ship. And um, Polyphemus wants um, Odysseus to come back so he can give him a hospitality gift, namely eat him. And um, Odysseus yells back and says, uh, no, 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 I'm not going back. Um, just remember what um, Odysseus has done to you. He's blinded your eye and stolen your sheep. Um, whereas, so here you have a synchrosis. O Odysseus blinds the guy and tells him, you know, go ahead and be a proselyte for me that I blinded your eye. Jesus cures the demoniac, addresses uh, him. The Polyphemus is always depicted nude in art. Um, he, he dresses him and he calls back and says, no, tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. Namely, he's, uh, he's exercised him. So here you have a magnificent example of a transformed myth where the Odysseus blinds and steals and Jesus cures. And uh, so Jesus is not plagiarized Odysseus. He's a compassionate and powerful Odysseus. Um, and he sails away. I mean, the parallels just go on and on. It's amazing. I think Dr. Uh, Crossan, <laughs> when I recently interviewed him about this, he was talking about how the legion, which would be like Rome, in a sense, it represents the power of Rome, like you said, uh, not even the pigs want to live with the with the romans you know in trying to enter the spirit of rome if you will trying to enter them they're like no we'd rather die and commit suicide than have you in us but it's also this according to him i think he thinks there's a little more of like a maybe a colonel here that's saying like get out of our region stop controlling get get out of our area we don't want you here and that seems to be what he's saying but he hasn't taken that connection to the cyclops I don't know if anyone yeah. else has. Yeah. Is there anyone else who's jumped on board with the Cyclops? Um, well, my students do. And um, uh, several readers have said that's one of your more convincing cases. Yeah. Mm. No, I think I think what Dom uh, was saying, or uh, Dr. Crossan was saying, yeah. it's largely correct. Um, I'm not sure that um, the, um, the swine wanted to kill themselves. 
that's the one part I'm not sure of. But yes, this idea of uh, leave our our area um, is is purging the legion from uh, Gal and by the way, there are lots of places where the Gospel of Mark is uh, critical of the Roman Empire. Mm. I, I enjoy these this this whole thing. I, we mentioned before um, about Jesus's baptism and. Some take more kernel to this, some think more literary. Maybe there's both, don't know. But the idea that he's empowered, and I, I wanted to allow you to tell our audience, we got like 250 people watching both on Facebook and YouTube. Can you tell us how there's this connection to the Greek literature with Jesus' baptism? What are we finding? I, I love it. It's, it's powerful. Very hair, Hairs can kind of stand on your arms. Telemachus does, starts doubting that his father is Odysseus and things like that. Can you tell us about this? Um, the Odyssey begins with a crisis. Namely, Penelope's suitors are eating her and her boy, uh, Telemachus, out of house and home. And uh, Athena goes to Zeus and says, uh, Father Zeus, uh, you can't let Odysseus and Telemachus be so far apart and to be uh, punished it the way they are. Send Hermes to um, Calypso so that she can free, uh, free Odysseus, but I'll go to Telemachus and empower him. So she puts on her sandals and she flies to um, Ithaca and disguises herself as a, a male friend of, um, uh, of Odysseus. Uh, only Telemachus sees her. And um, he, she says, what's going on with all this nonsense in your household? And she said, well, my, my dad's been gone and I'm helpless. I don't even know that I'm really his son because I, he left when I was just a kid, uh, an infant. And uh, of course, people never are sure really who their father is. You know who the mother is, but you can't always tell who the father is. And she says, oh, no, um, you are your father's son. I can see it in you. And you need to exert the authority over the house and get rid of these suitors. And then uh, she flies away like a bird. Well, Jesus, uh, the Gospels uh, begin with a crisis, namely uh, 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 Israel is uh, in captivity. And um, the Holy Spirit comes to, upon uh, Jesus flying like a dove. And the heavenly voice says, you are my beloved son. By the way, beloved son appears over and over again in the Odyssey to express um, the, the joy of uh, his parents for Telemachus. The idea of beloved son in the Septuagint occurs in only two very obscure areas. It's all over the place in uh, the Odyssey. So when you have beloved son, think Odysseus. I mean, uh, think, um, uh, think Tele Telemachus. So then what does he, what does Telemachus do? He goes out and declares that uh, there's going to be a, um, a, a change. I'm going to get rid of the suitors and reestablish authority over my father's house. What does Jesus do after his baptism and his temptations where he shows his medal? He proclaims the kingdom of God, his father. So the parallels are just so amazing. I love that. Oh, I, I wanted I yeah. wanted to say one more thing. Let's go back to the Gerasene demoniac just for a moment. When uh, Christian intellectuals um, in Byzantium wrote poems about the Gospels, and these are called the Homero Centones, they used the first thirteen lines of the introduction of uh, Polyphemus to describe the cave where the Gerasene demoniac lived. They clearly saw the similarities. Now people say, okay, McDonald, how are you so smart? It's not until the 20th century that people saw these similarities. And I, my answer is, well, maybe I am smart, but I'm not the first person to have seen them. 
They've already been seen by Greek speakers mm -hmm. in, uh, in the history of the church. I'm simply tagging along with the, those insights. These are called the Homero Gentones. We also have invitations in the Acts of Andrew and the Gospel of Nicodemus. So there's an intellectual tradition of identifying the gospel stories with classical mythology. And these are Orthodox Christians. These are not heretics. They are not Gnostics. What they year are was the that? Kinds like of people. Well, we don't know. The Chantone, there are five of the Chantones, the two earliest ones. We know one began in the fourth century and another one around the sixth, I think. Okay. I, 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 so just so I get this right, Jesus is baptized and it is clearly portrayed like he's empowered. What I found interesting about this in, in comparison to Athena telling Telemachus, hey, your dad is Odysseus. I know it's you. She flies. The Holy Spirit flies down upon Jesus. Then Jesus goes. So it doesn't end there. Like Jesus actually goes and starts putting <laughs> that power to the test. And people are like, hold on. Don't we know this guy? Like what got into him? The same thing. Telemachus goes into the house with the suitors and he's like, look here, here's the deal. You know what I mean? And everyone's like, what the heck got into Telemachus? Wouldn't you? So does it follow from there? Is there more that continues? In the oh, absolutely. Well, especially in the Gospel of Luke. Um, Luke has the uh, Jesus returning to Nazareth in, right after um, he arrives in, um, in Galilee. And um, he, the, um, what he reads in the synagogue is about the liberation of Israel. And he says, today, this has been um, accomplished in your, um, in your hearing. And later on, the people who are there try to kill him, to throw him off a mountain. What happens in the Odyssey? Telemachus um, brings together his neighbors he tells them that he wants this, the suitors to be gone, and um, after, but it, he infuriates uh, his neighbors, but especially the suitors who then want to kill him. So um, here you have Luke recognizing already in Mark and maybe in the Q document already the parallels with the empowerment of Telemachus. Yeah, that was one of the questions I had before. I didn't know if you touched that in your books, the return of Jesus as like going away for a long time. I didn't know if that second coming that we talk about, I don't find that in any other literature, the way the New Testament describes Jesus. I talked to Dr. James D. Tabor, which he's well aware of, like the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he said that when the teacher of righteousness died, they gave it a generation. They talk about a generation language of like when the end would happen, but not a second coming. So what really made me think maybe there's some Greek parallel here or at least a trope that he would return might have come from the Odysseus mythology or the, the Homeric epics that Odysseus is gone. It may not be a 40 year period, even though it's 20, he comes back. And of course, what happens when Jesus comes back or is supposed to come back? There are some people who think in some sense, like I used to as a preterist, they believe that the second coming did happen. They want to try and say that the destruction of 70 AD is the second coming. Um, he destroyed those who were in his father's house. You kind of wonder if the author is playing that kind of motif and he's saying, hey, just like Odysseus came, bow and arrow out, ready to take out the suitors in his home. He tried to warn you. You turned his father's house into a den of thieves. And sure enough, he came back to his father's house and he destroyed the enemy within. And this is what 70 AD is portraying. I didn't know if you thought maybe there's something to that. Where do you stand on it? No, no, I don't think it has anything to do with 70 AD because um, the most of these texts that have to do with the second coming are written after the Jewish war and therefore could not have anticipated the Jewish war. And also these are not sayings of Jesus, as far as we know, they're a part of this tradition. Now, um, just, I want to not correct you, but to um, embellish what you said. 
when Jesus returns in this mythology, it, yes, is a punishment on his enemies, but even more so, it's the rewarding of the faithful. So uh, like Odysseus, when he comes home to um, Eumaeus and um, Philodius and Eurycleia and others, he rewards them for their faithfulness. But it's the suitors who had given him trouble that he's going to slay. So you have this same um, understanding in the Gospels. When Jesus returns, he's going to vindicate and reward lavishly. I mean, the disciples are told, you'll each have a throne sitting on a, uh, uh, you sit on a throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, you're not laying up treasures on earth, you're laying up treasures in heaven. Well, that's going to happen when Jesus comes uh, comes back, um, as in the parable that we talked about earlier. Uh, those who have been faithful will be rewarded, and those who have not will, will be uh, punished. So um, I don't think it has to do with the preterist position. I think it has to do with, in fact, the delay of, uh, of the, the parousia. Thank you, Dennis. Man, I really appreciate this. I want to say again to the Super Chatters, Constellation Pegasus at the end, and my buddy Gary from Topic Discuss. Thank you again for those fives. And uh, he said, is that all you got, Constellation? Uh, <laughs> and then Constellation says, yes, I'm exhausted now, Topic Discuss, waiting for James Webb images, more relevant anyway. Well, thank you so much for the Super Chats. I really appreciate it. Um, everybody, please... Go subscribe to Gary's YouTube channel. It's been growing significantly, and I hope it continues to do so. Also, go to Amazon. I've got the link in the description. I've got a recommended book list with lots and lots of books in there, so you can go get Dennis's works in there. I've all sorts of academics. So if you're looking for like a reading list of what recommended by Myth Vision, it's down in the description. And Dennis Mc, Dennis R McDonald org is his website. So for the 240-something people watching, I'm putting that in the chizzy. So everybody can uh, go over there, check out the website, and email him, and he will, uh, he'll be in contact with you for sure. The last thing I wanted to do that I didn't get to up front, I'm working my butt off. I really am. I just dropped another video, uh, academic. Robert G. Hoyland is one of the leading <laughs> academics in the Islamic studies, uh, Western scholarship. Was Mecca really the original holy city of Islam? And it's a real serious question, not a conspiracy theory. It's a legit academic question to ask in Islam. What was the original holy city of Islam? I did another one with Dr. Andrew Henry from Religion for Breakfast on Jesus the Magician. What did Morton Smith get right? What did Morton Smith get wrong? And I know Dennis could actually get into this too. He had a – not to trash uh, what's happened because we, you, know, you really valued Morton Smith's work, but you had Morton Smith kind of lose his cool – after one of your lectures, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. McDonald. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Mm. Just before he died, actually, uh, he had one of his students tell me that he thought I killed Morton Smith. Um, what? Because he had a, he had a heart attack just two weeks later. But anyway, I did not kill him. Yeah. So, no, uh, no, but no. that's uh, that was. Uh, I'm going to have to go soon, Derek. I got you. Uh, because because my earplugs are are telling me they're running out of battery. I was just wrapping up, letting everybody know, join the Patreon. You can private message me, help us out, continuing to go. Um, really appreciate that. Someone says, I get the feeling Achilles dunk in the pool and Telemachus case are part of a reoccurrent theme. I think you're probably right about that. But thank you, Dennis. Any final words to our audience? Um, make something beautiful today. Um, injustice is ugly. Racism is ugly. And we live in an ugly world and we need to have your creativity. Uh, call in your muse and get inspired to do something beautiful. Thank you so much, Dennis. Go check out his work and never forget, we are Myth Vision.